Just connect to the energy. Energy activation. That's Kundalini. Time term for mixed. A lot of people ask me my story. So when was your grand awakening? Well, whilst I've had risings of my Kundalini, I never really had a big awakening. It's just, it's just something that's always been there. That's why I can sit here and talk to you and send energy at the same time. I'm so in tune with the energy now, it's always flowing with me now. And yes, I close my eyes a lot, but I can do it with my eyes open. So my first experience, I was eight. I had to look up how old I was because I couldn't remember, but I could look it up because of what happened. In my first experience, I was eight. And I was going on holiday with my family from the UK to France. We were going camping. And as you do, car was packed up with all the camping gear and so you had to get the ferry so we got on the ferry and anyway we got we got out of the car on the ferry and I just got this feeling and it's like you have to see the doors close you have to watch the doors close of the ferry I remember it very very distinctly and so I said to my mum I want to watch the doors close of course my mum was like don't be silly, you can't do that. We've got to get out of the car and go up to the bit of the ferry. You know how it works with ferries. And I'm like, uh-uh, I have to see the doors close. No, 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 we've got to go. With... I'm going to get back in the car and lock the doors unless I get to see the doors close. And she was like, oh, okay, let's go and ask. Now in those days, you know, when, when you ask like, to go to the pilot in the cockpit of the plane, you could do it, kids, and you know, it was slightly different those days. And so we went to the technicians and found them, and she's like, look, my son really wants to watch the doors close, is he allowed to? Of course, he's obviously lovely guys. Yeah, sure, of course. And, you know, they were showing me that they push the buttons they had to push and things like that. And so we were there with them, and they showed us how they did it, and great and you know we saw the doors close and then I was happy and so we went into the ferry and that was it you know and then seven days later there's this thing with seven days I don't know why but there is seven days later we were still on holiday and we suddenly heard news the Townsend Tarrant and Zeebrugge Ferry Design. You can Google it if you want. It's there. And this ferry capsized. Lots of people died. Do you know why the ferry capsized? Because the doors weren't closed properly. That was the first big sort of whoa for me. And I'd had others previously when I was younger. And I'd see orbs of light and things like that, very typical things. But yeah, so the first big thing I had was, I was eight. And you know, things happened to me and was, I just got used to it, it was just part of life really for me that one is at school I never never ever got caught doing anything unless someone told on me 
from Grasmere. But otherwise, they could never catch me. And I got into my fair amount of trouble. But I would always ask permission and see whether I could permission in you know, primary school, ask permission, can I go down today? Can I go down to the railway tracks or can I go to where I'm not allowed to? And I get this answer, yes, today you can and no, you can't. And the days I couldn't, yeah, other people were down there and they got caught and, you know, so I learned to listen to these things. And then in secondary school, the same thing, you know, when you wanted to go drinking or smoking as you did in those days. And quite often I would go to, uh, it wasn't just there, but quite often I'd go to a graveyard, which was right by the, by the school. And so I'd always ask permission, can I go in? And it'd be yesterday, not today. And then some days it would be like, yes, you can go in. And then, you know, halfway through having a beer or halfway through having a cigarette, it was suddenly, but you've got to, you've got to put it out now. You've got to put the beer in a bin now and leave. But you've got to leave by, they would tell me, this specific gate. And so, you know, I'd say to people, some people would listen to me, they learned. I was like, we've got to go now and we've got to leave this way. So we'd all just leave. And this, I'm not telling you one story, this happened multiple times. And so we'd leave by that gate and we'd just be sort of coming round the front or whatever and then we would see a school prefect or a member of staff going in to bust people. So they could never bust me. And it's like years ago I was living in Madrid. Yeah, do you remember there were some terrorist bombs in Madrid and trains. And that was my train. Seven days before, said there was a seven day thing. Seven days before, I was on my train, going into the city in my commute. And I was sitting there meditating on the train as I did. And I opened my eyes and I just saw everybody was just dead. Yeah. It, it scared the hell out of me. There are quite a few scary ones. Um, so it wasn't even my station. As soon as the train pulled into a station, it was the station before, I, <laughs> the doors opened, I got out and I ran. There must be some very funny CCTV footage of me running through a station. And I ran and it scared me enough to say, sod the train commute, I'm taking the car in, even though it was a nightmare. And I did. And then, Seven days later, guess what happened? Hmm. I had many things, like that. not always seven days. Sometimes it's been the day before. So I had a friend that, a friend of a friend, their parent had an accident that they were picking apples off an apple tree, climbed up a ladder and they fell off. And we were with them, oh, I was with my friend and friend of the friend, and they got a call saying, uh, your mum's in the hospital, don't worry, she's gonna be okay, she's gonna be let out tomorrow. It was just a bit of a scare. And I just heard this thing, she's gonna die tonight. She's not gonna make it through to the morning. It's like, what do you do with that information? What do you do with it? Do you tell your friend? And they'd be like, don't be so stupid. The doctors have said she's absolutely fine. Do you tell them? Do you not tell them? It's a difficult situation. And guess what? They didn't make it through the night. So yeah, I've always been able to do things. Now if we talk about what people tend to talk about awakenings or risings, I did have a very big one. Um, you know, I just finished school, secondary school. I'm dyslexic, ADHD, so yeah, I didn't have a good time at school. Uh, but anyway, I'd left school and I went to work in the Alps in a ski resort in Italy, in Cervinia, by the Matterhorn. Very powerful, energetic place. Probably one of the most powerful 
on the planet. Matterhorn is a pyramid. And so I've been suffering depression from school for a good four or five years. Now, it wasn't diagnosed in those days, that type of thing, you know, in good schools, these things don't get talked about and, you know. But I later understood, once I got out of it, what I was going through. And the way I got out of it, it was, at the end of the season, I went to this little village and it was this beautiful little village. No cars were allowed up. You could only get there by cable car. And I went with a friend. And we were just there, sitting, meditating, chilling, right with the Matterhorn right in front of us. And this, this friend was very powerful energetically as well. And it was just all of a sudden, I just got this wave of energy. And even saying this, I can feel my hair standing on end. And it was just five years of depression lifted. I was just in such a state of awe and bliss. It was just the two of us there, just chilling, no one else around. The village was empty, it was the end of the season, the snow had melted, everyone had gone. But it was just this amazing afternoon of just sitting there, meditating, wandering around, dancing around. We didn't have mobiles to listen to music. We were just dancing and singing and, you know, whatever. In this wonderful trance-like state. That was the biggest one I've had. And then, you know, I got into Reiki went all the way through. Talk about Reiki lineages, I think I'm fifth removed from Usui. It's quite a tight lineage. But I already had it. I remember when my Reiki master opened me up, they were just like, you have so much energy your problem is you don't know how to handle it. So you start the day every day with so much energy and you end the day empty. It's like, yeah, that did used to happen to me. And so I started doing yoga, started yoga. Yeah, I'm a yoga teacher, Raja yoga, not Hatha yoga. around about the same time and it just went on and I've just been studying for 20, 25 years, doing courses, some absolutely amazing courses, not just energy courses, studying the internal arts, internal alchemy, Nagong, Niden, Qigong, Tai Chi, I said yoga, different types of energy healing, hypnosis, NLP, yeah, all the standard things. I mean, NLP, you know, I studied it 20 odd years ago with you know, the original NLP guys. It's not one of these courses of a course 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 that you find. So I was lucky enough to have to study, you know, with the original. And it's just been my path. And it tends to be that I found things by myself and then when I find things by myself, I go and look for things to qualify it for me. So it's like, I I suddenly sort of started being able to, obviously being a Reiki master, but then the energy sort of, I, I stopped doing Reiki for several reasons. One, because I could get affected quite a lot by 
other people's energy and I didn't know how to control it. So I remember one client, when I took their historial uh, medical conditions and stuff, they didn't tell me they suffered from migraines. I'd never had a migraine in my life. And so I was doing a session with them and suddenly I just got this huge giant pain in my head and I had to stop the session and well, I didn't collapse on the floor but I did literally collapse into a chair. I could not keep myself up. And whilst it happens, it doesn't happen very often anymore, it's taken me a long time to get over it. But for many, many years, I suffered from migraines ever since that day. But I didn't just stop Reiki for that. It's also because I had a lot of clients. It's like people, like with that, they like to be touched occasionally, like touched on the head, touched on the foot, things like that. Just so it's you know, in those days, because it was a transition from massage type of thing. But my clients sort of started to complain like, no, don't touch me, because when you touch me, it feels like you're burning me, or you're giving me electric shocks, or, so it, it got quite difficult to do it. But I just keep, kept going, doing what I was doing, not doing the Reiki, but kept going. Kept studying, reading, I've read into, you know, theology, philosophy, you know, Eastern texts, Western texts, what people call the occult and magic, and it's all the same thing. Yeah, okay, it's got a few rituals, it's got a few sigils and talismans and things like that, but it's, it's all the same stuff at the end of it. Different religions. It's the time trial. And then I got this sort of, again, this thing. It's as though the energy opened up. And so I started to research what it was. And I found out that it was called Shakti Pad. So I then went and searched people. See if I could qualify and actually see it, whether it, what I was doing was that. And, yeah, it turned out that it was right. And I've studied with so many people, some absolutely amazing people. In yoga, I didn't just study with anybody. Just pure coincidence that in the town I lived, we happened to have a yoga chaya. But I didn't know who was a yoga chaya at the time. Amazing Ayurvedic healer. You know, been well, president of, I can't remember what the name of the Yoga Association or Yoga Alliance is, but he'd been president of it like six years. You know, he was like six months a year in, yo in India doing courses and stuff like that. So I just happened to study with, you know, which things guide me that way. It's just been a path. And I haven't always got it right with teachers. Sometimes I've taken courses and they've been you know, spending lots of money doing courses, investigating. Some of them have been an absolute, complete waste of time. You know, studying energy work. And not just taking courses, but just receiving energy from people. And it's just like, you know, some people they seem nice, but when you start talking to them, it's like, whoa, hang on a sec, you know, red flags. It's like spiritual ego, airs of superiority. It's like, no one's above anyone else. And I mean that seriously, no one is above anyone else. You should never put anyone on a pedestal. No famous people, no kings, no queens, no politicians, no, they are just regular people. So are police, so are doctors, don't suffer from white coat syndrome. No policeman is superior to you. No one can give you orders. 
Now obviously people can ask you with education to do things for the good of what is morally right and correct and so a community can continue. That's fine, not a problem, as long as people talk to you with the respect that you deserve and you comply with the same respect, absolutely great. But then there are lots of, you know, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, there are a lot of people who have good intentions, but they're blind. And this happens a lot with spiritual people. They might follow some guru or something like that. And they're like, oh, you can't do that. That's dangerous. That's this, that's that. Like, really? Explain to me why. Oh, well, I can't. I don't really know. Mm. So you're telling, you're telling me what I do and what I've been doing virtually the whole of my life is dangerous, but you can't tell me why. I can tell you why. Because you've chosen to believe someone that doesn't know and has fed you that information leading you to believe. It's the whole thing of you know, a lot of energy healing sessions. You know, they can look almost like exorcisms. True. Because what is an exorcism? It's an energy healing session. Because priests used to they don't have the ability anymore. It's taken away from them when the church tried, tried to control their priests and enacted in England the Witchcraft Act. And that was not to control the population, that was to stop the priests from practicing magic because they were making too much money and not quite rebelling against the church, but the church was losing control. And then that followed on, it had its repercussions. And... But so then these priests lost the ability to do these things. And you know, just as in Christianity, in every religion the snake is a good thing, but in Christianity it's a bad thing, so they can control people. So is the exorcism is releasing your demon. Yeah, energy healing is releasing your demons. If you look at it as in chod feeding your demons, your shadows releasing your traumas, your demons are your traumas. So an exorcism is an energy healing session, releasing your energy blocks. Yes, they're the same thing. An exorcism is an energy healing session. It's just people have been manipulated to believe that it's evil, even though they're not, because an exorcism helps people, and that's exactly what the priests were doing. They were helping people when they did the exorcism. They were saving their souls. Mm. So why is an exorcism bad? If for an people who worked for an establishment did it, it was good. But then it was suddenly bad. What? That makes no sense. You have to think for yourself. You have to understand these things. You have to just observe and don't believe all the rubbish people will tell you. And there's a lot of rubbish, especially in religion. Blind following the blind. Good intention people, I am sure, and that is why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But I mean, if you talk about Christianity or the Abrahamic religions, just read about the God of the Old Testament. Anyone who follows that and can't see what that is, well, you know, they're pretty blind if you can't see that. But it still goes on today. People enter other countries, kill people because their leaders tell them to and because they're paid to do it. Just, you know, to fulfill profits. And I'm not talking about godly profits, I'm talking about manly profits. Hmm, profit and a profit. Hmm, that's interesting. Why have they got the same name?
spelled differently, but it's the same word. A prophet does great things, so we work for a prophet. Hmm. Many things like this aren't coincident. Demonizing certain words isn't coincident. Isis is a goddess. Nishwastika is a good luck charm in Hinduism. The hexagram is a hexagram. It doesn't belong to any religion. The pentagram is a sign of life. It is a representation of the five elements. Please remember to like and subscribe, share the video.